I'm continuing my series of talks on socialist strategy in the UK. Previous ones looked at issues like financialization of the British economy, looked at the, the ruses that the rich used to avoid taxes and how these tax loopholes could be plucked. I'm now turning to what used to be the core of the socialist message, which is how to end exploitation. Back a hundred years ago, when the Labour Party adopted Clause 4, it adopted a clear socialist objective to get rid of exploitation. It said to secure for the workers by hand or brain the full fruits of their industry and the most equitable distribution thereof that may be possible on the basis of common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Now that aim has two components. One, full fruits of their industry and two, common ownership. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on full fruits of their industry because I think that is the tactically most important aspect to emphasize if you're in an electoral struggle. What does full fruits of their industry mean? The Labour Party constitution was committed to it, but obviously they only made limited progress towards it. You can say that the Labour governments of the 40s and the 60s did actually reduce the rate of exploitation, but they didn't abolish it. What would you actually have to do in legislative terms to abolish exploitation in Britain? You have to start out by looking at the forms of income that already exist in Britain. And we can divide them into the non-exploitative incomes and the exploitative incomes. The non-exploitative incomes are those where people are being paid either for the labour they've done themselves or labour they did in the past or are being compensated for their inability to work. So that non-exploitative incomes include wages, earnings of the self-employed, state pensions and sickness benefits. Now, it's true some very high level of wages move people who are nominally wage earners into the exploiting sections of society, but we'll leave that to one side at the moment. The exploitative forms of income are quite clear. They're dividends, which go to shareholders. They're, they're rent, which go to the owners of land and buildings. They're the profit of unincorporated companies. Um, there's interest payments going to banks. And there's royalty payments going to the owners of patents, trademarks and intellectual property. I, I mentioned in my last talk that interest and royalty payments have become a favourite way of hiding the, the surpluses of companies because interest and royalty payments are free from corporation tax. Now, if you look at the flow of income created, the flow of value created by labour, first, the companies where you work skim off a large part, acting as proxies for all these groups of people. Some of them go, some of the, the money is skimmed off for the shareholders as profits or dividends. Some of it goes as rent to the property companies that rent out the industrial land or the business offices and premises that the company is operating in. Another part goes as IP to people who are supposedly lending the company trademarks or patents. Another large chunk goes as interest to the bankers. Then when you get home, you've taken what remains after the, all these chunks have been skimmed off the value you created. And you still have to pay the exploiters in various ways. Most people have debts, so they're having to pay the banks interest on those. A large proportion of the population live in rented accommodation, so there's another large chunk of income goes to urban landlords. And down at the bottom, people are left with a much diminished share 
to spend as real consumption. Now, the old labour approach to abolishing exploitation didn't actually focus on the forms of income. Their policy was nationalised firms in order not to have to burden the taxpayer immediately with the cost of nationalising the firms. They did this by issuing state debt to state bonds to compensate the former shareholders. The great advantage of that is there's no cost to the exchequer and it kept the property owners quiet. The disadvantage is that there was a long term cost of paying interest on this debt and the property owners actually retained their wealth and social position. It only changed the, the form of exploitation. That is, until inflation eroded the value of the bonds. That was actually the main means, or a major means, by which the relative share of income going to the working class rose under previous Labour governments. Industries had been nationalised, bonds had been issued to compensate for that, and then wage price inflation meant that in real terms, over the years, the amount of interest being paid went down. But it has the disadvantage that there is no immediate benefit to people. You need some kind of radical alternative instead of that, that so that you can appeal to people that it's going to be in their benefit immediately. So we have to ask, can a radical reduction in economic equality be brought about without explicit appropriation, expropriation? I believe it can, provided we exercise some ideological ingenuity in the way we present it. We have to learn lessons from the success of Thatcher. Thatcher sold a movement in the reverse direction, privatisation. Privatisation was popularised with the privatisation of council houses. And this had the advantage that it offered an immediate payoff to many working class voters. It had an immediate bribe. And in that way, the Tories were able to cement a majority during which they carried out a whole series of other privatisations. The problem was that old-style nationalisation gave no immediate payoff to the voters. If socialists are to succeed now, they need an unashamedly populist strategy. And we have to present any changes in property relations in such a way that they appear to be fair and justified and most importantly, make most voters immediately better off. In order to see how to face the problem, you have to say, how can we win a referendum to ban exploitation? How can we put the matter in such a way that a clear majority of the population would be willing to go to the polling booth and vote to end exploitation? I think the answer is you have to hit all forms of economic exploitation in one go. For interest, you have to abolish all interest payments. For urban rents, you have to have a policy of exploitation free rent. I'll explain what I mean by that later. You have to get rid of all profit income by mutualising all firms. And you have to get rid of royalty incomes by giving a right to copy, not a copyright. I'm going to explain some of the details of these policies and the implications they would have in the long term for financial structure, etc. in later talks. I'm just going to run through the politics of it at the moment, the politics of building a coalition to vote for it. Now, it's clear that there are millions of people in Britain being ground down by huge levels of interest on debts. If you look at what payday loan companies are charging, 
they're charging up to a thousand percent APR or over a thousand percent APR um, credit card companies have been charging up to 79 percent interest rate what I'm proposing is that there be an ex abolition of exploitation act that makes the charging of all interest whatever the rate of interest unenforceable in a court of law so that interest payments will no longer be a recognizable civil debt in a court of law and any attempt to obtain the interest payments by threats would then be the criminal offense of demanding money by menaces who would benefit from this well obviously people with payday loans are going to benefit people with credit card debt people with mortgage debt people with student debt now if you add all that up it begins to look like a very large proportion of the population personal debt in Britain is 1.5 trillion pounds the average adult has a debt of over 30,000 pounds the average adult has a credit card debt of seven over 7,000 pounds the average student leaves university with a debt of 32,000 pounds and on top of that the public sector is paying 49 billion a year in interest on the public sector debt if we just ignore the extra taxes you're being uh, the extra amount you're being taxed to pay the national debt the average household is paying 1,800 pounds in annual interest there's clearly a lot more winners than losers if you abolish interest payments I'm suggesting that a an abolition of exploitation act specified that urban rent in order not to be exploitative is not allowed to exceed insurance of the building maintenance and repair costs plus at most a 20% management fee which is analogous to a factors fee uh, at the present now If you go to websites giving advice to landlords you find that this amounts to roughly 300 pounds a month that an average landlord has to pay now since the average rent in London is 1600 a month and the average rent even in the north of England is 700 a month it's clear that non-exploitative rents would mean a saving 400 pound a month to the average private rented household in the north of England and 1300 pounds a month to the average renting household in the south of England again this would give very very concrete reasons for people to vote for the end of exploitation who are the winners and losers here well 20% of the population live in private rented houses that's 9 million voters the losers are 1.75 million landlords who are currently making about 50 billion a year out of us clearly there are many more winners than losers and that's what counts in electoral politics that's what counts if you're going to put this to a referendum now let's turn to what has in the past tended to be the principal focus of socialist exploitation at work but I think a lamentable failure of socialist propaganda has been to spell out just how extreme the exploitation is at work and just how much money you would be taking away in your pay packet if you weren't exploited if you look at the latest blue book or um, supply and use tables 
the current breakdown of the capitalist sector last year had nine, 963 billion pounds paid in wages compensation of employees that includes wages um, national insurance etc um, payments into pension schemes the gross operating surplus that is the total amount of revenue going to the property owning classes in the private sector was 766 billion well what does that amount to per each employee there are 27 million employees in the private sector that means that if you abolished exploitation at work, the pre-tax income of the average private sector employee would rise by about 28,000. 28,000 increase in your income. Now, if all firms were converted into mutuals, i.e. ones which paid out all their profits to their employees, the mutuals would undoubtedly have to decide to set aside some of their operating surplus, not as wages, but as modernisation and investment in new equipment. But I went and looked at what the gross capital formation in the private sector last year was. 40 billion. Suppose we double it. Suppose you invest twice as much as the, pr the private sector was currently investing. That would mean that, that there would still be 696 billion free of property income which could be redistributed as wages. That's still an increase in pre-tax pay of 25,000. 25,000 per employee on average. Suppose there was a simple referendum question should the UK end exploitation yes or no suppose it'd been prior debate to explain what it means suppose this is a binding referendum not the kind of nonsense about an advisory one that the Brexit one was and that it comes into effect the day after the vote if the vote is yes suppose that was the case Let's add up the winners. Nine million private sector tenants, each going to save £400 a month. 27 million private sector employees, each going to gain 2000 a month. 16 million struggling with debt, saving £150 a month. Add it up. Who do you think would win? Yes or no?